Hi, and welcome to the next lecture in fluid mechanics. Last time, we started to consider the dimensions of problem. These base dimensions are mass, length, and time, and almost all fluid parameters are combinations of these dimensions. We found by following the rule of dimensional homogeneity that we could solve complicated flow problems without knowing physics, by just making sure that dimensions are consistent. Today, we're going to explore non-dimensional numbers. One of my favorite aspects of fluid mechanics is that almost all analysis by nature has tons of non-dimensionalization. Thinking about quantities relative to other quantities in the problem. We'll introduce some common non-dimensional numbers that you'll see throughout fluid mechanics and where they come from. Let's jump in. Non-dimensional numbers are numbers that are generated when you normalize a quantity by some other relevant quantity with the same dimensions. The end result is a number without any dimensions or units at all. Imagine being asked the question, is one meter a long distance? To you, maybe not, but it really depends. If you ask an ant, yes, that's a pretty long way. It probably takes some amount of effort to, for an ant to travel one meter. A human might say that's not really that long, but it depends on the problem. It's not a long walk, but it is a relatively long standing jump. To a planet, one meter's minuscule. Whether we realize it or not, we are always thinking of quantities relatively and comparing them to other common quantities in our heads. Let's compare some dimensional and non-dimensional quantities that we see in real life. Baseball is famous for statistics. Sometimes you might hear a player has 23 hits. I'm not sure if that's a lot. In a season it isn't, but in a single series it's huge. We typically hear statistics like 0.33 batting average. If we were to enter a building, we might not be able to grasp how tall 33 meters is, but it's much easier to think of 10 stories. Thinking back in history, 300 years might be a bit less useful than thinking 10 generations. You might have money in some stocks. If the market goes up $10, I have no idea what that means, but I can better understand it if it goes up by 0.2%. In this chart, the left numbers are dimensional and often aren't so helpful. The right numbers are non-dimensional. Batting average is the number of hits normalized by number of temps. Stories is building height normalized by story height. Generation is the length of time normalized by a lifetime. And stock percentage is the monetary increase normalized by the size of the market. When you're non-dimensionalizing, you don't just divide by any number. You pick a relevant parameter, and that relevant parameter depends on the problem. Let's consider one other non-fluids example. Say you're bench pressing 200 pounds at the gym. There are multiple ways you can think about this 200 pounds non-dimensionally. Maybe you're entering a competition where people of all shapes and sizes compete, and often those competitions judge in terms of body weight, so that's what you normalize by. Maybe you are a non-lifter and wondering if that is a high amount for an average human. Instead, you might be joining a bodybuilding competition and you're wondering how you compare to an average bodybuilder. Maybe you're moving a bunch of boxes and you're wondering how many trips you'll have to take. Or maybe you're buying some weight plates for a home gym. Now you know how many plates to order. As you can see, it's very situational and there are many ways to non-dimensionalize a quantity. Fluids people use non-dimensionalization frequently and we also have to consider the situation. Here we're going to present some non-dimensional numbers and most are centered around four sources from the conservation equations. Consider the conservation of momentum in the x-direction. Generally, this represents flow inertia on the left-hand side, and pressure, viscous, and weight forces on the right-hand side. Here we use weight as an example body force. First, we need our normalizer. Inertia is probably the most common parameter to normalize the forcing quantities. 
Inertia is represented in these non-dimensionalizations as rho u squared l squared. Here, u is a reference velocity and l is a reference length. These references are very problem dependent and ultimately up to the user. For example, in flow between two plates, you might use the center line velocity as the reference velocity and the distance between the plates as the length. Ultimately, the choices require some knowledge of your problem and are critical in determining the non-dimensional number. Often the references have been chosen for a specific type of fluid flow and widely used by the community. You might ask, where does this rho u squared l squared come from? It's not even clear that it's actually inertia. Here's how I think of it. Consider kinetic energy, which goes as mass times u squared. Another definition of this is to say kinetic energy is force times distance. Let's isolate the force, which we consider the inertia force. The way I think of this as the inertia force is, it's the force it would take to stop the particle from moving in a distance l, some reference length. The heavier or the faster the particle is moving, the harder it is to stop and the more force it takes. In this case, we're going to replace the mass by density times volume, and the volume is really just the reference length cubed, kind of like reference volume. Put this all into the equation and simplify. This gives us the force of inertia going as rho times u squared times l squared. Keep this inertia in mind because we're going to use it to normalize a bunch of other force sources and they will get dedicated non-dimensional numbers. In the next few sections, we define the most popular of these numbers. First, we have the Euler number. It is quite common, although not necessarily called the Euler number when it appears in fluids. In aerodynamics, for example, it shows up as coefficients of pressure or lift or drag. The Euler number is a non-dimensional number that compares the pressure versus the inertia. If it's big, the pressure force is much higher than the inertia. If it's small, inertia dominates. First, we derive the pressure force, where we change in pressure is equal to force divided by an area, where area is reference length squared. This gives us the force of pressure being delta P times L squared. Thus, if we were to normalize this by inertia, dividing through and simplifying, we get an equation for a dimensionless quantity. And this is the definition of the Euler number. Keep in mind, the velocities and lengths are reference lengths you need to decide based on your problem. In application, we see the Euler number show up in disguise in aerodynamics when looking at lift and drag non-dimensionally. You might also see it in pressure-driven flows, where the pressure gradient is important. Next up, we have the star of the video, the most famous of non-dimensional numbers, the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number compares the viscous force in a flow to the flow inertia. It's flipped, so in this case if the Reynolds number is very big, the viscous forces become negligible, meaning they have no hope in slowing down the flow. When it gets smaller, viscosity becomes more important. The force of viscosity follows, follows Newton's law of viscosity, which is a shear stress times an area where the shear stress is the dynamic viscosity constant times the velocity gradient. Here, the change in velocity is changed to reference velocity of the problem, and the change in y is a reference length. The area is this reference length squared. Let's normalize this by the inertia force. It seems arbitrary, but in this case things are flipped, so we technically normalize the inertia force by the viscosity. Plug in the two terms and simplify we get the definition of the Reynolds number. In application, you use this to define when the flow is in the turbulent flow regime. It's used in all flows slow enough where you can't ignore it. And if you go super slow, this defines the creeping flow regime when viscosity dominates the inertia. Next up, we have the Froude number. You might be noticing a trend. Instead of naming these numbers conveniently after some physical feature that would help us remember it, they're named after the famous people that developed them. So, 
If you study fluid mechanics enough and develop your own non-dimensional number, this is how you get famous. The fruit number is the weight versus the inertia. The force of weight is fairly simple, mass times gravity, which turns into rho L cube G. Let's normalize it. In this case, it's not only flipped over, but also square rooted. Who knows why? Plug in the two force equations and simplify to define the fruit number. The fruit number is often used in application when considering liquid surfaces, such as wavy flows. Especially it is used when you have surface ships, and a ship researcher fruit is the one that originally came up with the number to scale a research problem. Next, we venture into some non-dimensional numbers that are common, but not necessarily associated with terms in the Navier-Stokes equations. The Weber number is the surface tension versus the inertia. Surface tension comes when you have two neighboring fluids of different type. The particles or molecules in water have an inherent desire to stay near molecules that are the same. Air behaves the same way. It's this attraction that keeps things held together, otherwise all molecules would just do their own thing. So, at the junction between two fluids, you get a surface. Breaking that surface takes some amount of force, and that force is represented by the surface tension. The more attracted the fluids are to themselves, or how much they hate the other molecules, defines this force. The force of surface tension is sigma, a constant that is determined for all liquids and gases through observations, times a length scale. Normalizing this, we come to the definition of Weber number, which is the inertia force normalized by the surface tension. This is used when you have droplets, like rain, small surfaces like the meniscus of a cylinder, thin films, and bubbles. And last but not least, we have the Mach number. When flow goes fast enough, or when bodies pass through a gas fast enough, it can become compressed. This compression takes force, and that's a force we can compare to inertia just like everything else. The force of gas compression is defined as the bulk modulus of the gas times an area. Now, we don't have time to get too involved with this, but the bulk modulus is the change in pressure a gas experiences for a given relative change in volume. We can replace the relative change in volume to relative change in density through things like the ideal gas law. Delta P over delta rho is the speed of sound of gas squared. On this, you're just going to have to trust me. If you're interested in why, it's covered in a lot more detail in my Intro to Compressible Flows video in my Aerodynamics video set. Ultimately, this lets us replace the bulk modulus with something meaningful. We find the force of compression to be C squared rho L squared. Normalizing this by inertia gets us the Mach number. Although it started a bit complicated, surprisingly it boils down to a simple velocity ratio. The reference velocity compared to the speed of sound. You use the Mach number in the study of high-speed aerodynamics, like missiles and fast aircraft, and high-altitude flight, like spacecraft. And that's the last of the non-dimensional numbers. There are many, many more, but these cover a wide range of fields and are relatively widely used. In practice, we use non-dimensional numbers for a bunch of reasons. They determine what flow regime we're in, depending on our flow type. Reynolds number determines if the flow is laminar or turbulent, and Mach number determines if flow is compressible or not. These numbers also tell us what we can and cannot ignore in our problem. If the Mach number is way less than 1, you can ignore the compressive forces. And if Reynolds number is super high, you can ignore the viscosity. And we use these when we're scaling problems, as we will see when we discuss similarity. You need to match non-dimensional numbers when doing small-scale experiment, experiments of full-scale problems. 
And that's it. Let's review. We started by introducing the concept of non-dimensional numbers, how they are used in everyday life, and how they are problem-dependent to be useful. A lot of non-dimensional numbers in fluids can be sourced back to the forcing terms in the conservation equations like pressure, viscosity, and body forces. Inertia is our normalizer, which we compare almost everything else to, although notably there are plenty of non-dimensional numbers that don't compare to inertia not shown here. The Euler number compares pressure and inertia, common for aerodynamics. The Reynolds number compares viscosity and inertia, commonly used for defining laminar and turbulent flow. The Froude number compares weight and inertia, which is most popular in large ship flows. The Weber number compares surface tension and inertia for things like bubbles and droplets. The Mach number compares gas compression and inertia for supersonic high-speed aerodynamics. And in practice, the non-dimensional numbers define our flow regime, they let us know what we can exclude in analysis, and they help us scale problems. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.